and Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach has finally launched, and with it, we now have a whole load of mysteries to discuss. What's the deal with the Vanny Therapy tapes? Why is this room from Sister location in the Pizza Plex? Who is the best animatronic, and why is it Music Man? There are a lot of things to solve in this massive game, as lore hides behind every pirate poster and inside every arcade cabinet. But the theory I have today goes to the heart of this game, addressing the one character that we spend a lot of time with, but don't actually see all that much. And that's our main character of Security Breach, Gregory. Yep, in a franchise full of dead kids, I want to focus on the first ever living child we've seen in the main story of the games. Except for in the Fruity Maze minigame, but we all know that she ends up dead. Who is Gregory? What is Gregory? And why is he such a cold-hearted savage to Roxy and the rest of the animatronic gang? I'm so mad that you're driving without my permission! <laughs> oh my gosh! Gregory is brutal! My friends, the answers to those questions will recontextualize everything that you thought you knew about this series. So let's begin. Hello Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, the show that can't help but stuff its face with FNAF lore like Chica stuffs her face with pizza. And garbage. I guess at this point it kind of applies to us too. Anyway, if you want to stuff your YouTube feed with FNAF videos, then hit that subscribe button right now, because today starts what I expect to be a three-part series into the many unsolved mysteries of Security Breach. I mean, on the surface, the game seems pretty self-explanatory, right? Survive being trapped in a mall for one night. Looks like the new team forgot to read the title of the franchise. But that's nothing, that's easy. Once you start looking into secret rooms, secret tapes, secret endings, secret minigames, and actually bother to read all the emails and item descriptions, you learn that there is a lot more here. Stuff that looks both backwards at the series that came before, and forwards into what is coming next. Stuff that, quite frankly, I'm still working on piecing together. This is a big game with lots of places to hide things. But today, I want to focus on a mystery that I do feel like I have a pretty solid handle on. The relationship between between Gregory and Glamrock Freddy. What's the deal with this random kid and why is a killer animatronic suddenly trying to help him? Like seriously, the game kicks off with this incredible cutscene. Everyone is living their best 80s-tastic lives on stage before Freddy suddenly glitches out and smash cut to Gregory just being there, I guess. It is one of the weirdest, most jarring intros to a game ever. And then from that point forward, we're just expected to assume that everything is perfectly normal, no explanations necessary. So I'm here to give you that explanation explanation, because I strongly suspect that this boy is not a boy, and this robot is not a robot, and that the story of their relationship is one that's trying to make amends for one of the earliest and most pivotal points from this entire franchise. To begin, let's establish what we do know about Gregory in order to piece together the rest. So what does the game offer us in terms of his backstory? Nothing. First and foremost, we know that he's pretty much off the radar. At the start of the game, Freddy does a quick scan only to realize, Your guest profile is unknown to me. Similarly, when security guard Vanessa is chatting it up with Freddy, we hear this part of their conversation. That is great news. He can be returned to his parents. He can't. Turns out, there's no record of him. Clearly, Gregory is not a guest at the Pizzaplex. It also seems like he has nowhere else to go. In the game's bad ending, unlocked by just leaving the building at 6am, we see Gregory winding up in an alleyway sleeping in a cardboard box. He appears to be homeless. He's an orphan. This then explains a few other things that we see around the Pizzaplex. In a couple of hidden locations around the building, we find little dens that are filled with drawings, plushies, and beds. The most notable one being the one behind the daycare center. Gregory seems to be living inside the Pizzaplex, which would explain his lack of a guest pass. We can't even be sure that his name is Gregory. In the game's opening scene, Gregory has no issues speaking to Freddy. Will you shut up? Who said that? I did. However, once Freddy asks him for his name, he stutters. I... Uh, I'm... Gregory. Why would he stutter on his name when he was clearly fine answering everything else just seconds before? So... what? Is that it? Gregory's just some homeless kid that sets up shop in the Pizza Plex and happens to get wrapped up in Afton and Vanny's plans? Yeah, right. Of course not. Nothing in this franchise is ever an accident. Take a look at Gregory here. Notice anything familiar? Dark eyes, brown hair with a piece falling between his eyes, shorts, a shirt with two stripes across the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, Gregory is none other than the crying child. Don't believe me? Early on 
on, we get this weird moment when Freddy suddenly stops what he's doing and says this. I feel you are broken. We all know that the language in this franchise is never chosen by accident. Everything is meticulously crafted, so is it a coincidence then that the word broken is only used one other time in the FNAF series to describe a child? That iconic FNAF 4 clip with crying child and golden Fredbear, you're broken, we're still your friends, I will put you back together. The fact that both crying child and Gregory look alike and are considered to be broken screams of a connection existing between these two. Him being the crying child would also explain why he has nowhere else to go. His dad is an undead zombie living inside a yellow bunny suit, and his mom is MIA. There's also lines like this. Your parents want you to follow me. Your family is looking for you. Let me take you to your parents. On one hand, this just sounds like Chica spouting out some generic security protocol. On the other hand, if indeed Gregory is the crying child, Chica's lines here take on a whole new meaning, because she is quite literally bringing him to his family. His father living in the basement, William Afton. But obviously there's one big problem with this, one that I'm sure all of you are screaming at your monitors or typing aggressively down in the comments. Crying child is dead. He died in FNAF 4 when his older brother Michael picked him up to be chomped. And not only did he die, his soul then went on to be one of the two spirits possessing Golden Freddy, the other being the vengeful spirit Cassidy, before he was finally put to rest by the puppet in the happiest day ending of FNAF 3. This kid is well and truly gone. He is removed from the franchise. He is one of the few cards that are officially off the lore table. So why then do I dare invoke his name here? Because Gregory is a robot. A rebuilt version of the crying child. Flame shields activate because it's time for everyone's favorite segment. MatPat uses the lore from multiple FNAF books to try and explain parts of the game that don't make sense. I'll try to make this as quick and painless for all of us as possible. In the books, children having tragic premature deaths and then being rebuilt as robots by their grieving fathers is something that happens a lot. Like, if I had a nickel for every time this plot line showed up, I'd have, well, I'd have like three nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened three times. In the original novel trilogy, the whole big twist of that was that Charlie, daughter of Henry Emily, died as a kid, and that her father put her back together by building robotic versions of her, each one representing a different stage of her growing up development. Then again, in Fazbear Frights, we have the character of Eleanor, who is strongly implied to have been built as a replacement daughter, as well as Dr. Talbert, who developed Remnant as a way to preserve his sick and dying daughter. And all of this is without me even going into the numerous stories where children get swapped out for robots and or Fazgoo, which, uh, once it has your DNA, basically creates a clone of you. Uh, if that's the future of the franchise, we're going down some weird paths, my friends. Anyway, to summarize, there's evidence in the wider canon that FNAF 4's lines about the crying child being broken and needing to be put back together were meant to be much more literal than any of us first suspected. But we don't even have to go that far. Within Security Breach itself, there is plenty of evidence to suggest that Gregory isn't exactly what he seems. When Vanny spots you and starts to get closer, your vision gets a CRT effect, basically the horizontal lines that old TV monitors used to get. And it's worth remembering that since this is a first-person game, that is representing your vision. So why are your eyes suddenly behaving like cameras on the fritz? Unless, you know, they are cameras on the fritz. Later in the game, once we defeat Roxanne Wolf, we can take out her eyes and upgrade Freddy. Our Fazwatch tells us that, quote, Roxy sees things differently than others. Sometimes she'll stare and talk to the other bots through walls. She's able to see things that others can't, which allows us to see collectibles like secret CDs. In a way, she has a sort of x-ray vision, which is why when you first install him into Freddy, his comment really stands out. How are your new eyes? I am having a hard time adjusting. You look different to me. Hmm. It's almost like he was seeing Gregory as a normal child, but now that he has these new eyes, he's able to see through Gregory's skin and reveal something that he wasn't expecting. Like, say, an animatronic endoskeleton. Also, Gregory can be inside Freddy when he's inside the charging stations, which on its own feels weird. Like, I kind of expected you to hop out and leave him to charge, but nope, we pilot him inside of it and then sit there as he charges. Or could it be that those charging stations are as much for us as they are for him? Remember that secret den behind the daycare where we assumed Gregory 
Gregory's living, there's a strange amount of decommissioned and what appear to be salvaged security robots. Maybe for a kid who needs a robotic upgrade. The fact that there's no record of Gregory would also make sense. If he's an animatronic, there wouldn't be records of him because he's not technically a human. It would also explain why Gregory has no parents. But maybe the biggest point of evidence comes from the very beginning of the game, where during the opening cutscene we see Freddy glitch out. This sets him on a course of being good for the rest of the game. But what causes that glitch to happen in the first place? Well, by going frame by frame, we can see that there's a security threat on the loose, and it looks to be a small child. What? It's Gregory. It has to be. Gregory is the threat here, a robot that poses a threat to Freddy's programming. But why? How? What, what, what would make sense about that? Well, to understand that connection, it's time to put a pin in Gregory and turn our attention over to Freddy. If you unlock the game's final secret ending, you end up going below the pizza plex, only to discover a former Freddy Fazbear location, Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Place. If that name doesn't mean anything to you, it shouldn't, really. Most of the restaurants in the series go unnamed. But while the name might not mean anything, the layout should be a familiar one. One large rectangular stage with lights on the trim and big speakers on either side and a smaller semicircle stage right next to it. It's from FNAF 6, Pizzeria Simulator. Notice the stools that are placed right in front, the checkered floor. We even have purple striped tablecloths and blue, green, and red plates exactly like we saw in Pizzeria Simulator. As a refresher, this is the location that Henry lured all of the roaming animatronics to in order to burn them to the ground one final time. Although for one of you, the darkest pit of hell has opened to swallow you whole. So don't keep the devil waiting, friend. And this is it, here. Seems like Henry's plan didn't quite work as expected. We still see pretty much everyone that he tried to torch away, and they're all alive and well and thriving underground. Springtrap is there, Molten Freddy is there as this big black blob, and if you look inside that blob, you can even see Baby. And heck, even the puppet. Kind of lessens the impact of that Savage Henry speech from FNAF 6, but whatever. Anyway, the reason I bring this up, outside of it giving me a chance to remind everyone that I totally called something like this happening at the end of the last theory from a year ago is that one character is notably absent here, Michael Afton, who we're reasonably sure was the guard working at the FNAF 6 location and the one who helped to burn it down. And to you, my brave volunteer, who somehow found this job listing not intended for you. Although there was a way out planned for you, I have a feeling that's not what you want. I have a feeling that you are right where you want to be. After being scooped, turning purple, and trying to undo his family's sins location by location, he went down with the ship and burned alongside his father and sister. Which means that presumably he should be here somewhere. And yet he's not. Unless, of course, he's taken on a new form. Say perhaps Glamrock Freddy. We know for a fact that Freddy's been down here based on some of the lines that he drops during the finale. I know what this is. I have been here before. She brought me here. I had no choice. Now I have a choice. I have changed. My friends are here. They are so angry, confused. But I can protect you. So he's in a place where he can get possessed. We also hear that Freddy isn't acting like his normal self, saying, I am not me. And in yet another ending, the fire ending, Freddy is more than prepared to set the place ablaze, much like Michael Afton did to Fazbear Frights at the end of FNAF 3. I guess old habits die hard. And nothing says that clearer than the replica of Mike's room from Sister Location that's hiding inside the Pizza Plex. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, hidden inside the mall is the exact replica of Mike's living room from Sister Location, down to the TV, lamp, and basket of exotic butters. Exotic. 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 But butters. <laughs> But here's the kicker. Over on Mike's wall is a coded message, one that was solved through an incredible team effort from Daco and the rest of the FNAF subreddit. It reads as follows, quote, Break and mend, I built the breath. They hunt now, drawn to life. Not real, still me. And frit and fraught with thought and zest and guessed no blunt woes. Dodge, duck, flash, shoot, crawl, run, crush the vile band. Cry not, try not, do not hold out hope. Your life, your aim will save those with soul. I feel like this is some sort of a poetry reading. Snaps, everyone. Snaps. Snaps. 
Yeah, man, cue the bongos. All right, basically, this is just a bunch of fancy talk all relating to Mike's personal journey. The first line is all about breaking and repairing things, and in doing that, creating new life. In other words, Ennard and Baby. The rest is all about his commitment to try and stop the evil animatronics and try to save any of them with a soul left in their bodies. Now, does the presence of this room and poem necessarily mean that Mike is Freddy? No, but I do think it's telling that we're reminded of Mike's commitment to save everyone inside of a room that you're required to find alone in the dark, i.e. without Glamrock Freddy hovering over your shoulders. Heck, during the finale, we even get this line from Glamrock Freddy. My friends are here. They are so angry. Confused. He's talking about Molten Freddy, the spirits trapped inside of the blob. It's very possible that those were indeed his friends captured and killed back in the day. Maybe William himself struck back against the kids that had bullied his youngest son, and now some of their spirits are trapped below the surface as part of the blob in this abandoned restaurant. Or maybe that's why Gregory is so brutal to all of these animatronics at the end of each boss battle. They killed him back in 1983, and now it's his turn to show the bullies no mercy. By launching a go-kart at their face and ripping out their eyeballs. And meanwhile, Freddy is sad because they are quite literally his friends from when they were alive. But to me, honestly, the biggest connection points between Mike and Glamrock Freddy are thematic. Their narrative. Mike has been moving to location after location to try and undo his father's horrible work. This would just be a continuation of that story, as both Aftons return post-fire. And more importantly, it also completes the arc of the crying child and his older brother. Since accidentally killing his brother in FNAF 4, Michael's been trying to make amends. This would be quite literally their grand reunion. An older brother finally able to protect and defend his younger sibling in a way that he failed to earlier in their lives. This is also why Freddy's programming would glitch out after he encounters Gregory in the opening cutscene. The soul of Mike, buried deep in Freddy's code, comes through upon sensing his brother again. It hotwires the system so that Michael Afton, in the body of Freddy, can defend his kid brother. And the Afton story doesn't stop there either. In part of the Pizzaplex, we find a family dinner dinner scene made up of decommissioned staff robots. A father, a mother that kind of looks like Ballora, a daughter with rosy cheeks and orange pigtails, a son, and one with its head missing, the child whose head was bitten off in 1983. This is very clearly the Afton family. There is no doubt about that. The story continues in this game. In fact, I expect that's why the Save Vanny ending here is so important. If you manage to find and complete all the Princess Quest arcade cabinets hidden throughout the Pizzaplex, you get an ending where we are able to save Vanny from the control of Glitch Trap. This is something that we predicted would be possible literally a year ago in a theory, but I bring this up not to pat myself on the back, but rather to call out the final moment of this ending, where we see Gregory, Freddy, and Vanny all sitting together on a hill. A hill that I should point out is oddly reminiscent of the FNAF 6 Gravestone Hill. It feels meaningful, like all these characters have some sort of history. Why would Vanny be there otherwise? Unless this is meant to be the crying child, Michael, and maybe even a Elizabeth, the Afton children, the three kids who literally had their lives stolen by the evil deeds of their father, finally reunited, finally able to share a moment of peace on this hill. After all, Vanessa does have green eyes and blonde hair, just like someone else that we know from the series, but uh, that's probably a theory that's best saved for another day. Long story short here, Gregory isn't just any kid. He's not just the crying child either. He's the rebuilt version of the crying child, an animatronic designed to fill the void left by the death of Afton's youngest son, literally put back together piece by piece. And Mike, meanwhile, is also back, glammed out this time, continuing to make amends for his past by reuniting with the brother that he accidentally killed as a kid and protecting him in a way that he never could before. Which then leaves us with a question, who's Vanny? How does she fit into all this? Why does she fit into all this? And why does robot Gregory glitch out each and every time she gets close? That, my theorists, will have to wait for the next episode, because this episode's running along and honestly, I need more time to think through the answers. So in the meantime, theorists, remember, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss how all these clues fit together. You're not going to want to miss that next episode, mostly because, you know, if you do, the FNAF lore will no longer make any sense to you whatsoever. Plus, hitting the subscribe button's free, and let's be honest, at this point, you owe it to yourself to see how it all plays out. But for now, remember, it's all just a theory. A game theory! Thanks for watching.
everything the game has presented to us thus far. First, one of the key pieces of evidence last episode was this line right at the start of the game where Freddy says to Gregory, I feel you are broken. This, to me, was a clear connection back to the crying child from FNAF 4 where psychic friend Fredbear says to him, you are broken. I mean, kind of speaks for itself. It's a parallel that's made stronger when you actually remember how that line gets delivered back in that game. There was really no way of knowing back when FNAF 4 was released, but thanks to a secret room found in Sister Location, we know that psychic friend Fredbear is actually a plushie with a walkie-talkie inside of him. A walkie-talkie that allowed William Afton to scare and manipulate his youngest son. Father of the year, ladies and gentlemen. Also know that throughout FNAF 4, all of William's lines use the color FFFF57, a bright golden yellow. Golden bunny, golden yellow, makes sense. But the iconic final lines of you're broken, I will put you back together, actually use a different color. A lighter yellow, FFFFA0. Back then, we never really came to a satisfying explanation was it a mistake? Was it another spirit? Was it maybe the puppet? But now, seven years of investigation later, we know for sure someone else is indeed talking here. Someone who, in sister location, is mistaken for his dad. Someone who turns purple just like his dad. Someone who can't die like his dad. And someone who had the lines immediately prior apologizing to his kid brother, but when that didn't get through, decided to try comforting him through the voice of his best friend. It's Michael Afton represented by a lighter color of yellow, a color that symbolically connects him back to his father. In short, we have Michael Afton in FNAF 4 saying the line, you're broken to his brother through the voice of a Fredbear plush. And here in Security Breach, if we're right about all this, we once again have him saying the same line, you're broken to his brother through the voice of another Freddy, this time Glamrock Freddy. I personally think it's a really cool narrative connection between all these games. But a lot of people were quick to point out that there's dialogue in the game files that was cut from the final release, where Freddy says that Gregory is bleeding. Specifically, he says, Your arm is cut badly, and I am detecting blood. You are injured. This, for many people, disproved that Gregory's an animatronic, and uh, I actually have two things to say about that. First, when I've used cut lines of dialogue in the past, the internet has in no uncertain terms told me that I can't, but uh, now apparently it's okay. Eh, kinda inconsistent there, guys, and honestly, I think cutting it, regardless of the reason, shows that it didn't fit the final creative intent of the game, but Anyway, if that's the case, then I gotta bring this line up. A cut line of dialogue discovered by GB Aura recharged in the game files. This one is Freddy saying, Gregory, I know why you're not in the customer database. I remember you from the- And it cuts off. Obviously, it's vague. It's kept very intentionally vague. But it also shows that Gregory is special in a way that the other disappeared kids aren't. There's a reason he's not in the customer base. He's from somewhere specific that Freddy knows about. If I were to guess, I'd say like, the underground pizzeria, but, you know, that's just me hypothesizing. Adding to the Gregory is special idea is the fact that Chica knows his name. She calls it out in the middle of the pizzeria. <laughs> Strange detail for a kid who supposedly has no records in the system. Secondly, and I, uh, I hate to be the bearer of bad news here, but in the books, because everybody loves when I go back to that well, animatronic children do actually bleed. They can also cry and feel cold. Heck, they can even feel hungry and eat. And you don't even have to go to the books for that one, you can just see it with Chica's pizza obsession and security breach. So to tell me that a robot child can't bleed? Yeah, I think you gotta really look at the franchise that we're talking about here. And for everyone who is confused about the timeline of Crying Child still being alive and the fact that he would be older at this point, that wouldn't actually be the case. Animatronic children in the books stay at whatever age they're built to be. Charlotte Emily actually had four separate versions of herself built, one for each stage of her life, so that way she could grow older, but she would just assume a new animatronic body each time. So Crying Child still being young would actually make more sense here. And to everyone saying, why would he say stuff like, don't want to be crushed and twisted into a meat pretzel? No, again, Charlotte in the books is shocked to learn learn her true nature in the final chapters. Her consciousness had been grafted onto a childhood toy while she was alive, and after her tragic death, had been placed inside of a robot body to function as her memory. So for all she knew, she was just a normal human being just like anyone else. Is it dumb? Yeah, I'll say that it is. Is it complicated? <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. But is it giving us insight into the rules that Scott and everyone who touches this universe operate by? Yes, it undeniably is. Lastly, for everyone who spammed my feed with pictures of sad white boys and 
striped shirt saying that you had found the crying child, thank you for your help uncovering the lore. I get the joke. All white boys with brown hair and striped shirts are apparently the crying child. But remember what series we're talking about here, friends. Visual design details have always been an important part of figuring these games out. Take a look at Baby. During Sister Location, she has green eyes. But when you play her minigame, she has blue ones. At least until she kills Elizabeth Afton, who, lo and behold, had green eyes. Superficial design features like this help us to connect the dots. Are they the be-all and end-all of evidence? No, but they do help support an argument. So a little brown-haired boy in shorts with a shirt and two stripes? Seems sus. Have you ever heard of Among Us, Gregory? Speaking of eyes, for all the complaints about the last episode, no one seemed to have any answers to what I see as the two strongest pieces of physical evidence here. Why does Gregory look different when Freddy gets Roxy's x-ray eyes? You look different to me. And secondly, why does Gregory's vision glitch when he sees Vanny? Why does he have such a weird visual reaction to her and to literally no other character in the game? Well, you hear that high-pitched ringing sound as Vanny skips and gets closer? <laughs> It seems to be a disruptor that makes her invisible to animatronics with older model eyes. In the fire ending, Freddy, who couldn't see her at any point in the game, explicitly says, I can see you now. I have new eyes. I mean, this is exactly how the much-hated sound illusion discs from the books work, creating a high-frequency sound to make people and robots invisible and or look differently. But I'm already fighting a losing battle over here, so I'm just gonna gloss over that one. Anyway, to me, it reads as Gregory's robotic eyes being disrupted. I mean, why have CRT? T lines over the screen and not some other type of filter to show that his vision is getting disrupted. In fact, why have the same CRT lines as the security cameras all around the pizza plex? But there's one final piece of evidence I'd like to talk about to help solidify that previous theory before we move on, and that is the screenshot here of the final scene from the savior ending, where you rescue Vanny from the control of glitch trap. And uh, I use quotation marks here because there aren't any official sources giving names to the various endings. In the game files, they're just labeled as S1, S2, and S3 based on the number of stars that you get for them. It is worth noting though that this is the only three star ending that currently exists, which seems to imply that it has some level of importance to it. But here we see our three main characters, Gregory, Freddy, and Vanessa all sitting on a hill, which as I pointed out last time is very similar to the FNAF 6 gravestone hill. But that's not what's important here. What I want to point out is the ice cream. Gregory is holding a golden Freddy shaped ice cream with part of its head bitten off. If Gregory is not meant to parallel back to the crying child in any way, shape, or form, then this detail is just mean and irresponsible. This ice cream is the crying child's story coming full circle. He was terrified of animatronics and ended up being bitten by the Golden Freddy spring suit, but now he's the one sitting on a hill taking a big old bite out of Golden Freddy. That is not me reading too much into this. That is me lightly interpreting a very clear image that was put directly into this game by the designers. It is barely even subtle. And despite him wearing a blue shirt in most of the endings, here his shirt is colored purple, just like his father's signature color. Couple that with literally everything else, his lack of records, the fact that he goes into the charging station. So I stand by my theory that Gregory is an animatronic of the crying child. Is it a perfect answer? No. Do I love the fact that it complicates the lore even more? No. But does it answer the most questions with the evidence that we have? I believe it does. And it's a heck of a lot better than Fazgoo. But now, for pages into this episode, let's actually stop to talk about Vanessa, shall we? Last episode, I made a passing statement about how this final image felt to me like the three Afton children getting reunited. Crying child, Michael, and Elizabeth Afton. William's daughter that done got scooped by baby back in sister location. It's a scene that, to me, feels like the narrative finally giving them a sense of closure after they quite literally die as a result of their dad's evil deeds. Last time, I briefly made mention of Vanessa's blonde hair and green eyes, which is the same as Elizabeth. And here, in this ending, we actually see two scenes of her wearing the signature Afton purple. Even the ice cream cone, as opposed to something like Gregory's novelty pop, is a potential callback to her death where Baby delivered an ice cream cone to her before she did the scoop. And when you look at the connections between these two characters, it's more than just a couple of visual similarities. The biggest secret in Security Breach right now is a series of 16 retro CDs, invisible collectibles that only Freddy can see, hidden in every obscure corner of the game's map. 
Then, to play these things, you actually need to have also found the secret sister location room that we talked about last time. Now, these CDs are, um, well, uh, they're, they're problematic. They open up a whole separate can of worms. They're recordings of therapy sessions following two separate individuals, patient 46 and patient 71. The exact identity of patient 46 is a theory for next time that will absolutely launch us into yet another flame war, but early in patient 71's tapes, we learned that it's actually Vanessa speaking. Hello, Vanessa. How are you feeling today? These are recordings from therapy sessions that Vanessa had while she was at the job for the FNAF AR game Special Delivery. She mentions speaking to a man named Lewis on several occasions, and we discover that she's also buying fake fur, both of which are things that we see in emails from FNAF AR. By the last of Vanessa's recordings, she's leaving that job for a new job somewhere else, most likely the job of security guard here in Security Breach. I'm needed somewhere else now. But let's dive into the good stuff, shall we? In Vanessa's second tape, we learn about a custody battle that happened between her parents. Her dad won using manipulative tactics, forcing his daughter to falsely testify. Your dad made you follow instructions, didn't he? I'm talking about the custody battle between your mum and your dad. Your dad didn't play fair, did he? He used to make your mum look bad in court. After losing custody of her daughter, Vanessa's mother, well, here's what the tape does. I know your mum after she lost the custody case. It glitches, implying that her mother ended her own life, which would explain why Mrs. Afton is missing from all the games, and why she may have wound up being rebuilt as the motherly Ballora in Sister Location, a robot that, wouldn't you know it, sings about her inescapable depression now that the walls of her house are empty. All I see is an empty room, no more joy, an empty tomb. We also hear Vanessa lines like this. Oh, you like those? Apparently, the janitor on this floor has a garden and has been putting bouquets in the offices here for years. Vanessa likes flowers. A small detail, but you know me, small details could often be the biggest evidence. Who else do we know in the series that has an affinity for flowers? Well, think back to FNAF 4. Remember this random empty bedroom with a huge portrait of a flower on the wall? It's Elizabeth's room before she got scooped. Then you have Vanessa lines like this. Lots of people know more than I do. Some Sometimes I need to listen. Now, this might be a stretch, but I believe it's referring to when Elizabeth got scooped by Baby. Her dad had repeatedly and explicitly warned her not to go near Baby, but she didn't listen. And in doing so, she ended up getting herself trapped inside the animatronic. Don't tell Daddy that I'm here. I wanted to watch your show too. I don't know why he won't let me come see you. You're wonderful. Vanessa also says in her tapes that she doesn't like dark basements. I have a craft space in my basement. Maybe I could come up with something you could learn to do. I don't like dark basements. It's another line that seems to be pointing us in the direction of Baby, who is trapped underground for years in Circus Baby's entertainment and rentals, looking for a way back to the surface. I've been out before, but they always put me back. They always put us back inside. There's nowhere for us to hide here. There is nowhere to go. And to put one final nail in this coffin, right back in the second CD, we actually learn the name of Vanessa's father. I feel like I know your dad, too. No. Right? Bill is short for William. That's just the game trolling us with a coincidence, right? Wrong. You see, going back to FNAF AR, we learn that Vanessa's last name begins with an A. From there, we can connect the dots. Bill A, William Afton. But didn't Baby burn at the end of FNAF 6? Oh, <laughs> yeah, she did. But you see how effective that was. How are you not dead? I mean, to be fair, the thought that burning him is going to work is stupid, because people have tried to burn him to death no less than three times in this franchise. SPOILER ALERT, IT DOESN'T WORK! But here's the kicker. At the end of the game, we meet the Blob, a weird tentacle monster made up of all the original members of the series. FNAF 1's Chica and Bonnie, FNAF 2's Mangle, Sister Location's Funtime Freddy, a random endoskeleton crawling out of the bottom, the puppet mask without tears, I might point out, and Baby's face. Now, don't get me started on this being Baby's original face and not Scrap Baby's updated look where she came back to FNAF 6 in. I have words about that. Anyway, look at them all here on screen. You notice anything strange? Most of the animatronic's eyes are lit up. Funtime Freddy, Chica, Mangle, even this random endoskeleton at the bottom. But now take a look back at Baby's mask. The eyes are blacked out. So although the blob has absorbed Baby's body during the burning down of Freddy Fazbear's pizza place, her spirit, the spirit of Elizabeth Afton, is no longer present. It is unaccounted for. It is on the loose. And as such, potentially at large within the game. Is she insane? some way, Vanessa. And if so, how? The truth is, 
I don't know. This game has got my brain in so many knots, I might as well be a sailboat. I don't think there's any evidence to support any conclusion at this point in time. But I do know that this is what the evidence is heavily pointing us towards. The design similarities, the missing spirit, the purple color, the ice cream, the voice lines, the personality traits, and again, the narrative theme of three Afton kids reuniting and moving on after a traumatic past. It gives everyone this nice full circle ending, even if it's only meant to be symbolic. And the screen really does feel like it's the end, finally, for these three characters. Maybe next time we'll finally see some new faces. So enough about them, we're moving past those three. There's still other mysteries that we have to solve here.